All righty. Well, hey, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Monterey Bay Aquarium here live all across the internet. Hopefully we are beginning to stream live now over on Twitch, on Facebook, on YouTube, on Twitter, and Periscope. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being there. My name is Patrick. I work at the aquarium here in social media. Down below here is the better half of the social media team. There's Emily. Emily is going to be there for questions and everything. I'm going to be the one uh, producing the show. So if anything starts breaking, if we're suddenly streaming jellies instead of talking about albatrosses, that's on me. Uh, and joining us today is uh, a wonderful, wonderful personality that you might remember from early on in quarantine days. Uh, Kayla joined us for a talk with uh, our penguins, aviculturist Kayla, I should point out. She's the one who's over here on this side of the screen. And as an aviculturist, Kayla takes care of our many feathered friends that we have uh, at the aquarium. And today, it's very special, Kayla. Uh, you can see she's got her common myrrh mask on. Kayla is over at the aquarium right now, and behind her are some tremendous birds. Uh, Kayla, how's it going uh, Hi, over guys. at the aquarium? Hello. It's going pretty good. It's a beautiful day. It's nice and sunny out. It's wonderful on the bay. <laughs> That's excellent. So behind you right now, can you tell us a little bit of uh, who we've got uh, back there in the background? Where are you at the aquarium right now, actually? Yeah. I should point out so that I'm in my living room and <laughs> Emily's in her living room as well, um, as uh, the aquarium is not currently open. Uh, so Kayla, who's that behind you? Where are you? Yeah, so we're up on the roof of the aquarium. The smokestacks are actually just right across from me. Uh, and right behind us, we have our two Laysan albatross, Makana and Alika. So Makana is the one that's a little closer to us at the moment. She's standing up. She's doing a little bit of preening. And then Alika's behind her actually tucked away laying down right now. Gotcha. Um, and so can you tell us a little bit about uh, about those birds? Um, we've got uh, an albatross there in, in the background. Uh, that might be a bird that most people are not necessarily familiar with. But um, if you take a look behind myself my zoom background is an albatross and so uh so to emily uh there down below so before we get to audience questions there we've got a lot of questions about uh albatrosses can you just describe to us what kind of a what kind of an animal is an what kind of a bird is an albatross because um it might look a lot like a gull uh that we're going to yeah. go up to but uh very different and i don't want to like rank birds but maybe a little bit more special than a gull uh generally speaking yeah, so albatross are very special birds. Um, they are pelagic, so they spend most of their lives actually out over open water where uh, most people don't even see them. They typically will nest on very remote islands that are way out at sea as well. So lace and albatross are actually found uh, over around the Hawaiian islands and they nest primarily out on the Hawaiian atolls. So even the smaller islands of the Hawaiian archipelago that are like way, way out west. So again, very remote, but then they'll also spend a lot of time again out over the open water. So typically they're out over the um, North, sorry, the North Atlantic, not Atlantic, the North Pacific, primarily up around the Aleutian Islands and the Bering Sea when they're out looking for food, which is pretty dang far north from Hawaii. <laughs> Gotcha. And uh, for the folks that, that are watching the, the stream, apologies for seeing my desktop background there in the back. I was trying to switch some windows. Um, Catalina Island is what you saw over there. And that's not usually where you might see albatrosses, although we here in the Monterey Bay do sometimes have flybys of lace and albatrosses, but more frequently, uh, and actually seen this year, black-footed albatrosses. Um, so we, we know those albatrosses here locally, but I'm sure that the folks tuning in right now want to know more themselves about uh, albatrosses, the folks tuning in online. Uh, Emily, what kind of questions do we have uh, from the folks already there for Kayla? Yeah, number one question that we're getting right now, Kayla, are albatrosses very social animals? And I think that's a, a great question because, you know, we have Makana and Alika here, but most of the time albatrosses are out there in the open ocean. What's their life like yeah. out there? Yeah, so out on the open waters, they will sometimes um, feed in smaller groups of albatross, uh, at least this particular species, but it seems like they live a pretty long, lonely life. However, they're extremely colonial in their nesting time. So oftentimes they will nest in these large, large colonies, um, sometimes hundreds of thousands of birds. And um, they're very social. They have very, very elaborate courtship dances. They will make, um, they'll form bonds with their mates. Uh, some birds will mate for life. Others are more opportunistic and will find the right mate at the right time when time is needed. 
Um, but yeah, they are very social. So we, um, we do a lot with our two girls here to help make sure that they are well socialized. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And speaking of, of that, um, Kayla, we're going to see about a little bit of uh, trickery here, some some digital trickery, uh, because I'm going to see if I can pull up your. Uh, so what we're going to do, everyone, is we are going to try to get a closer look there at the birds from uh, Kayla's cell phone. So, uh, Kayla, we're going to connect your cell phone right now. We're going to see about walking a little bit closer over to the birds and actually see some of that enrichment uh, that you were talking about. So I have brought in the cell phone. <laughs> we see Casey's cell. Excellent. Okay. Uh -oh. Let's see. Okay, muting the cell phone. We're gonna see if this ends up if this ends up working. Okay, so if you mute your laptop, and for the folks that are tuning in at home, we're we're giving this we're giving this a shot. It worked earlier in the test. Okay, so unmuting Casey's cell phone. I don't know if you need to do that on your end as well. Uh, thank you, everyone, by the way, for for tuning in. If anything, once we get once we get the cell phone video, we'll be able to walk over or we're going to bring that laptop over here and just. Okay. I... How's that? Look at that. Hey. Yay. I did it. All right. You, you did it. Okay. So now let me highlight. Oh, goodness. We've got, we're moving, we're moving things. We're crashing yeah. through. The super okay. professional stream. So, oh, this is, this is, there this we is go. these are the girls just kind of having a nice afternoon little hangout at the moment. Um, but I have quite a few different enrichments that we're going to put in for them to play with. So we grab these and we'll hop up here with the pool. In the pool. Awesome. And here, oh, this so is, this is fun. I can actually go back and forth between the two different cameras there. So that we can see <laughs> you getting into the exhibit right now with. Okay, so who's that? Is that uh, Makana or Alika there? Yeah, so that's Makana that just stood up. She's like, "What are you doing, Kayla? We were having a nice little siesta." <laughs> Hi, girls. So that's they awesome. uh, usually have a little bit of. Uh, they usually have their afternoon feed at about one thirty. So at the moment, they've both got some pretty full bellies. That's why Alika's kind of having a nap there. Alika's still sleeping so. over there. Can, so can you tell us, Kayla, um, how is it that uh, these albatrosses came to be uh, at the aquarium in the first place? Yeah, so Alika and Makana both came to us through U.S. Fish and Wildlife, uh, both at very different times. So Makana came to us in 2006. Um, both of them, similar reasons. Uh, they both had injuries to their left wings that could not be uh, healed in order for them to lock their wings in place to do that awesome dynamic uh, dynamic scoring that albatross do. I'm sorry. I'm trying to zip tie something and I'm Oh it's no worries. If you it. if you need to put your phone down right now, I've got you on the second I've got you on the second okay. camera right now. So if you need to put your phone away for just a second while you tie it up. And who is being so incredibly noisy there in the background there? We got some very excited birds. <laughs> yeah, so there we go. Okay. We have a couple of black oyster catchers that moved in next door. Okay. <laughs> they are uh, actually from our seabird exhibit, and they recently have been doing a little bit of chasing of the puffins, and so we did not want to encourage that, so we just gave them their own space to enjoy their nesting space. Okay. And so right. can you describe to us the enrichment that, uh, that you have? Like, what is an enrichment generally for the folks who might be wondering at home? Yeah, so an enrichment are just enrichments are different types of things that we like to offer the animals in order to give them some sort of mental stimulation. So there are lots of different goals that we have when we do enrichment. We may be trying to encourage the birds to swim um, at the surface. We might want to encourage them to pick up and carry things with their beaks. It might also be something uh, social. So although these black oyster catchers aren't currently living in this habitat with the albatross, they are a social enrichment for them because the albatross gets to hear their lovely calls all <laughs> afternoon now. <laughs> now. If you had to uh, transcribe a bit of what oyster catcher, what the oyster catchers are saying right now, what, what are they saying? 
they're saying we are so sexy and we love each other and we want to build a nest. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> They're very excited. <laughs> Great. Um, so maybe uh, if we get a closer look there at some of the birds, uh, Emily, what uh, what kind of questions do the folks have out there right now? We're coming up with the close Hi, look at Makana and Alika. <gasps> look. Oh, okay, someone's waking up. Oh, Alika no. just woke up. Oh, they know. She's like, oh, my. <laughs> uh, well, Kayla, folks are wondering just how old our albatrosses are and then um as a follow-up question there we also have people who are curious you mentioned that these birds spend the majority of their life far away from shore out at sea in the north pacific how do they navigate when they're out there yeah so first question uh, makana on the left here is 14 years old and then alika on the right is three years old and Lace and Albatross are a very, very long-lived bird. Uh, they're actually the oldest known uh, living bird at the moment. Uh, there is a very famous albatross named Wisdom, who we may talk a little more about later, but Wisdom was tagged by U.S. Fish and Wildlife in 1956. And she is currently 69 years old and still actively nesting, which is just totally phenomenal. <laughs> nice. That's amazing. Yeah, we keep hearing those yeah. updates about Wisdom year after year uh, going... Oh, oh yes! <laughs> the little sky moon. Can you tell us what okay. just happened there? That's adorable. Yeah, so Makana just gave us uh, one of their wonderful little courtship behaviors and social behaviors they display called a sky moo. Uh, a lot of their different behaviors that they display can mean different things, but oftentimes when we see sky moos, it's a sign of um, just joy, happiness. She's feeling good, feeling great. Oh, that's awesome. And we saw a little bit of that wingspan there tucked away, yeah. opened up just a little bit. Um, so Makana has that um, has that left wing that doesn't fully extend, but a fully extended albatross has, uh, a lace and albatross has almost a six foot wingspan, right? A little bit over five feet. Yeah. yeah, very impressive. And they're actually a smaller species of albatross. The largest species, the wandering albatross, has a wingspan of about 12 feet. Wow. which is like two Makanas wide. <laughs> That's incredible. Uh, Emily, back to you for uh, any questions that the folks have out there. Yeah. So I uh, still want to make sure that we answer that question about how albatrosses are navigating out at sea. Uh, but we also have some comments just uh, coming in about how beautiful these birds are, specifically about what kind of looks like eyeshadow around their eyes. So uh, Kayla, I'll let you kind of decide uh, which question you want to go for yeah. there first. <laughs> yeah, so there, there has, so these birds, excuse me while I trip over my own tongue. <laughs> so these birds being pelagic and out over open water can be very difficult to track and to map and to really, you know, determine how they do navigate. But it, there's a lot of hypotheses out there that they use uh, the gravity, sorry, the magnetic pole, the science, the magnetic um, field fields of the field. Yes, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Fields of the earth is what they're primarily using to figure out where they're going they typically will return to the sites that they themselves hatched and fledged from. And even that um, isn't very well known how they know how they do that. They just, they, they have a homing beacon in their head and they know their way back. That's amazing. And uh, yeah. shout out, by the way, Kayla, to being able to talk while you've got two albatrosses staring you down, wondering where, <laughs> where the food is coming from. That, that's, that's high pressure. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Emily, back to you. Uh, what do the folks okay. out there want to know? Yeah. And so then, Kayla, those beautiful uh, black feathers that our lace on albatrosses have around their eyes actually also are a good adaptation for life out there at sea, right? Absolutely. Yeah. When you're flying out over the open water and the sun is shining bright, it can be so glaring. And that uh, black feathering around their eyes really helps cut down on that glare that they see. So they also have a really cool adaptation. Um, they have a Rajopstin is a, well, oh, having a brain fart again. My goodness, I'm so sorry. Rajopstin is a um, <laughs> pigment in the eye that helps with nocturnal vision. It improves nocturnal vision. 
So these birds have uh, the ability to see pretty darn well at night, and they are actually believed to be feeders at night primarily. So um, their primary food item that they'll eat is actually squid, and what they suspect is that they'll come down um, at night onto the surface of the water when the squid are oftentimes near the surface feeding, and then just munch on a whole, whole bunch of squid. <laughs> That's yeah. awesome. And we actually um, just had a great observation uh, by uh, one of our followers over there on Twitch who uh, made a great comparison that having those black feathers around our albatross's eyes to help reduce that glare of the sun off of the ocean is very similar if any of you are sports fans out there and have ever seen football players or baseball players put that black paint just underneath their eyes that's acting in the same way it's helping to reduce that glare bouncing into their eyes from a, the sun on a really bright sunny day so great observation over there on twitch uh, skittles yeah. over great there comparison. <laughs> that's a really great comparison um okay. kayla you know, these birds are truly, truly built for life out there in the open ocean. Um, some of the ones that we've talked about so far, so they have that, those amazing wings, they have built-in sunglasses uh, mm -hmm. around their eyes. Um, one of my favorite ones is actually the fact that they can drink salt water out there. Can you talk a little bit about that salt gland that they have? Yeah, so, oh, that, she's like, the wind's picking up, darn it. That thing's gonna get me. <laughs> <laughs> so just above their eyes, these albatross have a special gland that will actually uh, help them remove the water, sorry, the salt that they um, ingest from their food items, but also from drinking seawater. They also have a metabolic process that will convert the seawater into regular water, um, allowing them to, you know, they can stay out of their open, salty water their entire lives if they needed to and not need access to fresh water. Wow. And uh, we, we saw just then, uh, Caleb, that uh, the birds did respond there to the, the streamers there, the car wash kelp um, streamer <laughs> there. Um, can you tell us what their personalities are like? What would be a difference between Makana and, and, and Alika? Um, Makana yeah. being uh, a, a more senior albatross than a, a youngster <laughs> Alika, right? Big time. Yeah. So there's quite a few differences between them. And the first is their age. So Makana at the age of 14 is sexually mature and uh, in the wild would be, you know, going to the nesting grounds each year, finding her mate and potentially laying an egg and rearing young. Alika, on the other hand, is just kind of a wild teenager. So Lace and Albatross, once they fledge from the islands, they'll actually spend about their first three to four years of life just out over open water and never return to that home island. It's usually around this age, uh, three or four, that they'll actually begin to return home to the islands that they themselves fledge from, and they'll actually start dating. You know, they're they're looking for other singles out there. They're practicing their dance moves, and they're just kind of learning how to albatross. So we do see that dynamic here between our two girls quite a bit. Um, so yeah, I'm hoping we'll see some of it today, but Alika will solicit dance from Makana a lot. She will uh, do the sky moves, she'll clap her beak, she opens her wings, she does quite a few different moves than Makana, and it's all her just kind of practicing all these, um, all these different maneuvers to hopefully one day find the right mate. Now there's also um, a couple differences between them as far as their social, uh, their socialization as, um, as their life pertain here at the aquarium. So Makana lived the first 11 years uh, here at Monterey by herself, uh, and so she is very uh, imprinted on people and really enjoys people. So Makana will actually do a lot of these courtship dances with certain people that she's developed certain, uh, special relationships with, whereas Alika prefers to primarily try to dance with Makana. So it might have been a different story for Makana had she had a different, uh, sorry, another albatross to do those dances with from the beginning. But I think that in time, she'll learn to do them with Alika as well. But right now, a lot of times it honestly seems to overwhelm Makana when Alika begins to dance because Alika's quite a bit bigger and she gets much taller than Makana when they're dancing. And Makana usually is like, okay, that's enough, kid. I'm hopping in the pool. <laughs> that's, that's very funny. By the power of technology, I, I finally was able to identify Makana and Alika to the audience at home. They're Makana on the left, Alika on the right uh, there. Thank you for... Whoa, looks like we've got some activity happening on Cannery Row right over there. More sirens. <laughs> yeah, emergency awesome uh, on this particular stream. But uh, here, let's go over back to uh, Emily here real quick. 
Uh, Emily, uh, what do the folks want to know? Yeah. So uh, for those of you who are just tuning in right now, hi, uh, my name is Emily. I'm part of the social media team here at the Aquarium, joined by my colleague, coworker Patrick, um, who is also joining us from his house across the bay and then joining us at the actual aquarium itself right now, our amazing aviculturist, Kayla, uh, who is working with our albatrosses this afternoon and giving us a close look at those animals there. Um, yeah, hey, Kayla, go ahead and wave, wave to the computer and we'll be able to see you. Oh. Yay! Hi, <laughs> Hi, nice. Hi, Hi, Kayla. Oh, this is so cool. It was working. Yeah, this um, is great. <laughs> um, now, uh, our two albatrosses here at the aquarium, uh, their names are Makana and Alika, and uh, they are here because they are rescued animals that are unable to survive on their own in the wild. So I saw a couple of those questions coming in before and just wanted to make sure that we clarify that. We're actually um, the only facility in North America with lace on albatrosses, right, Kayla? Yeah, that is correct. Yeah, so these <laughs> two birds are and wait. Are you playing very very special here? And I, yeah, are you I playing with a feather with the birds? <laughs> Maybe a little bit. She's like, I want it, I want it. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Oh, they're so pretty. What do you think, girls? <laughs> oh, it's like I, that grass got stuck to my beak, and I didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> Good girls. <laughs> that's awesome sorry to interrupt emily you were saying yeah, something. no <laughs> i i am a thousand percent happy with being interrupted i got distracted by the bird cuteness happening on you know me patrick yes it's, it's, they're birds of <laughs> course i'm i'm very distracted we love right them now. love them bird nerds <laughs> um <laughs> exactly bird nerds for life over here <laughs> um we did get a question over there wondering about the courtship between albatrosses kayla are these monogamous birds do they partner for life or is it just partnering up for convenience out in the wild yeah, so they are pretty monogamous and they do primarily partner for life. But again, um, it's, it's a hard, they can be difficult to study. But going back to wisdom, uh, wisdom's been with the same mate, at least I believe since 2008. So she's been uh, kind of a pioneer for documentation of uh, things like this with Lisa and Albatross in particular. But again, yeah, they do primarily will mate for life and be monogamous with their partners. Awesome. And then Kayla, um, what kind of albatrosses besides lace on albatrosses? I know lace on albatrosses are um, somewhat uncommon to spot here in the Monterey Bay, but there are other albatrosses that we sometimes spot out there, right? Yeah, so there are three species found in the northern hemisphere, one being the lace sands, and then there's also the black footed and the short tailed albatross. And then the black-footed albatross is one that I believe we see most often here at the edge of the bay. You know, we get very, uh, we're very fortunate because we have a very productive upwelling here in the bay because of the depth that allows so much nutrient, uh, nutrient-rich water to come to the surface, bringing all kinds of tasty treats for birds like laysans and black-footed albatross to munch on. That's yeah, awesome. Yeah, and what having that rich water out there is great for so so many seabirds and especially these albatrosses but you know they're flying thousands of miles from Hawaii those uh, islands just off of the Midway Atoll out there all the way here to the Monterey Bay and and back which is just incredible um, one of the ways that they can find the food out here in the Monterey Bay though uh, Kayla is with smell correct is through smell yeah that is correct <laughs> So like smell and then also uh, what we kind of talked about before uh, with the ability to see really well at night, they can spot these, um, the, I'm just, I don't, I feel like I'm having a brain fart. I don't think it's called a school of squid, but they will find these large we, groupings of squid. We, we like to call it? it a squid squad. Uh, we're, we're team <laughs> squid <laughs> squad over here. Amazing. Yeah. So, yeah. so they'll use that on. Um, They'll use their vision to spot those uh, squid squads on the surface at night and then go down and feed. But laysans don't only feed on squid. Uh, they are actually opportunistic uh, at feeding at times. 
and they might even, uh, you know, swoop down and find a little pile of carry-on uh, that they would scavenge on. They may find um, in a big bunch of seaweed washed up, they might find some pieces of like fish eggs or maybe even some little crustaceans. So it isn't just a squid-based diet and they will eat quite a variety of things that they can find. Yeah. yeah. And, and Kayla, that kind of ties into a, a great question that we had over on Twitch, which was what kind of challenges are albatrosses facing out there in the wild? Yeah, so a big one comes down to the way that they feed. So as surface feeders, they unfortunately are an animal that does ingest a pretty significant amount of plastic. And it isn't, um, you know, it's not just the adult birds that this is impacting, but it actually results in them taking uh, those bellies full of food back to their islands to feed their chicks. And they'll oftentimes feed chicks, um, uh, sorry, plastic that the adults have picked up from the surface of water. Now, plastic has a long life, and even if it's just plastic, you know, going down the street in your neighborhood in the Midwest, that could go into a storm drain, and that can enter our um, water systems, and it is all connected. <laughs> Absolutely, and uh, I, I believe, Kayla, you, you have actually uh, a tube with um, bits of plastic that were recovered from uh, an albatross or two. <laughs> Uh, oh, here, we can watch you gracefully exit. <laughs> Nicely done. So, thank you, thank you. <laughs> so, uh, Kayla, actually here, if you, if you turn back around, whoop, there she goes. Back in, okay, back around. Right. It's a live production. <laughs> See, because you can be talking into your microphone there, and then we have oh. you on that camera there. This, yeah, is, this is crazy. This is such a high quality yeah. production, everybody. This is awesome. Yeah, so what you have in that tube right there. Yeah, so these are all plastic pieces that were possibly, uh, sorry, were ingested by albatross. So these were actually um, extracted from the bellies of deceased birds. You can see there's a pretty wide variety of recognizable items in there from combs to lighters to bottle caps, all of it. It's all very attractive to an albatross. It looks a lot like a fish would look or a squid. And in their eyes, that's tasty, that's supper, that's something I can feed my babies. There you go. So that is uh, when we talk about single use plastic, everybody, uh, you're seeing it right there. Um, that Those plastic bits can also uh, glom up food, uh, food bits like fish eggs and things and kind of uh, serve as an attractant for albatrosses flying out over there. Good job on that transition there, Kayla, by the way. I had you up on, on the screen just then. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. But, uh, Ooh, you but yeah, so when we, when we talk about, um, when we talk about that single use plastic, that is what we're referring to is these things that we use and throw away. They don't go away. Uh, our planet is finite. Uh, and, uh, so, you know, if you have that piece of plastic and it still exists, then, um, it, it might wind up in, in the ocean and albatrosses are one of those birds heavily impacted, uh, by that. And looks like Alika wants to come and play. She does. She's like, when I want to see those. Like, oh, oh. <laughs> this thing is falling at me. <laughs> oh, yeah. See, Alika is doing a little bit of interpretation about, yeah, this is the exact kind of plastic yeah. that. I would love to possibly ingest this. <laughs> Oh, oh, nicely done, Alika. No, she she's pointing out. So this here is a lighter. That's a bottle cap. I assume that mm -hmm, you folks mm -hmm. are aware of these things. <laughs> <laughs> That's oh, great. Uh, Emily, so back to you. Oh, we've got yeah. both albatross. Sorry, we've got both albatrosses up and running. Uh, can you describe the scene, Kayla? What's going on? Yeah, the, the wind. The wind is getting wild, and it's causing them both to get whacked with their little car wash kelps. There, I assure you, these are very soft and malleable. They're not hurting them. Okay, but, but you've got them. you've got albatrosses on the move. Tell us a little bit about their majesty on land. Yeah. So uh, when albatross are on land, they are completely terrestrial and stay on the ground. But by golly, are they goofy? When you have great big webbed feet like that, it's kind of like walking around in scuba flippers all the time, which I'm not sure if any of you have tried, but as a human, I usually just have to shuffle backwards to do it well. <laughs> so, you know, we have to be, uh, I try to be very careful with how I place enrichments for them so as to not trip them. Uh, I try to always make sure they have plenty of space so that they can turn around and get away from one another if they want to. So you may sometimes see them kind of, they almost look like they get stuck in a corner sometimes because they're, don't quite realize they have the ability to turn around, but they could just back up. 
<laughs> so, Makana's doing a little egg chattering over here. Eater, eat, eater. Oh, can you, can you describe what that what that means? Oh, and oh, I've got a good shot right now of you uh, of Alika <laughs> here, full full camera while you're filming Makana over there on the on the other <laughs> side. Can you describe what you were mentioning there with Makana, the sounds that she was making? Yeah, so, you know, as a female, Makana is a hen, uh, and she does this behavior that we call egg chattering, where she does this little eat, er, eat, 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 er, and she, you know, this is what they would be doing to an egg, just kind of chattering at the little embryo in there. But also, um, you see some brooding behaviors when they do this as well. I'm not sure if I quite caught it on camera, but she grabbed a feather and placed it next to her. Uh, tomorrow, when I come in in the morning, I bet some of these grass pieces may be over there in the corner as well around her. <laughs> That's awesome. And meanwhile, Alika yeah. over here on camera one, just <laughs> really trying to figure wow. out how to rip apart that enrichment that you made for her. <laughs> yeah, there anything that we have that is a little basically a little bit dense and has this kind of squishiness to it, like a squid would have or a fish. That is something that the albatross really desire. You want me to get those cups out for you, Alika? You get it yourself. Here you go. We're a big fan of the stacking cup. <laughs> oh, and some of the folks out there probably recognize the stacking cups from uh, many a famous sea otter video. There you go, Alika. <laughs> <laughs> this is amazing. <laughs> So and Makana is usually like, this is so juvenile. Yeah, like, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so that's great. <laughs> yeah, you know, we want to encourage them to be curious, uh, to be able to explore their environment each day and be comfortable doing it. But also, <laughs> she comes a whole mouthful. But also have the choice to do nothing if they'd like. You know, Makana's like, the enrichment's great, that's nice, but I would rather take a nice nap at the moment. Yeah. I'm right there with Makana, we, honestly. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I know that's something that we talk about a lot when, uh, if for folks who have visited the aquarium in the past, um, who might have met Makana on, on a visit here. <laughs> Um, that we kind of give her the choice to come downstairs to participate in in our albatross program but the choice is entirely hers and some days she just feels like staying upstairs and swimming in a pool or taking a nap and she doesn't want to come down and see her adoring fans so uh, this little behind the scenes view is a special treat because she can do whatever she wants while she's up here <laughs> absolutely yeah we we value choice here. <laughs> so we always want it to be a fun, you know, we want the interactions that Makana gets to have with the guests to be fun for her, but also fun for the public. So of course we want to make sure Makana is a willing participant when we go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then she'll take trips around the aquarium on her cart as well. So it's always fun to change up those enrichments for her. For yeah, her. Absolutely. She's oh, trying her Alka. best <laughs> oh, my goodness. to not go in the water right now and get that toy, I see. Oh, absolutely. And every <laughs> once in a while, she'll, um, she'll get it out. She won't be able to reach it. She'll start peeping. Like, help. I can't get it. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> the best. Sometimes Makana is a bit of a, she's a, she can be a troublesome neighbor at times, a roommate, and will sometimes pull the enrichment uh, out of Alika's reach. <laughs> Oh, wow. He's like, I'm going to take these. Thank you. What are you doing, Makana? It's very sibling-like behavior right there. Almost. You can. Yeah, I think a lot of us can recognize this uh, similar type of roommate dynamic uh, <laughs> going on there. Um, uh, Emily, what kind of questions do the folks have uh, back at home while we enjoy? Um, for those of you folks out there, by the way, who who may have had grandparents uh, in World War II out in the Pacific Theater, great grandparents uh, out there, um, these would have been the birds referred to as guni birds. And so Laysan Atoll is out there in the northwestern Hawaiian Islands, which is uh, right on your way to Midway. Uh, island, which you may have heard about uh, from your history classes. So um, there were a lot of these birds out there that many of the sailors and uh, and um, soldiers out there would have uh, come across out in the middle of the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. So Guni birds, because of how uh, 
ungraceful, disgraceful, whatever the term is, when they're <laughs> on land trying to take off or go, uh, can be a little bit uh, of, of comedy there. But once they're uh, on the wing, some of the most majestic birds uh, out uh, anywhere in the in the world got a little octopus. <laughs> They didn't realize it was an octopus that whole time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. So uh, Kayla, folks are curious, how can you tell male and female albatrosses apart from each other? Yeah, so typically you actually cannot. They are pretty similar in size and they do not actually have color uh, differences at all. So it can be very difficult. <laughs> uh, our two girls, uh, the, you know, a lot of times everyone's asked me, like, how do you tell them apart? So a big thing is size. If uh, they are standing side by side, Makana uh, is a little bit smaller of an albatross, sorry, laced an albatross than Alika is. They're pretty similar in weight. Makana is about 4.8 pounds, where Alika is a pretty solid 5 pounds. But Alika is just a little taller, so her height is quite a bit uh, greater than Makana's. <laughs> Excuse me. But Alika yeah. also has a little leg band that came with her um, that U.S. Fish and Wildlife had tagged her with when she came. Not when she came. I think it was when she was in the Pacific Rim program, but yes. Makes sense. Yeah. And now folks might be a little surprised with that that weight that you just mentioned there. <gasps> oh, Kayla. wait. Just how light these birds Whoa. are. Hello. Oh, hi. Hello, Alika. Alika, what are you doing, goofball? <sighs> Oh my goodness. There you go. <laughs> Saying hello to the friends at home. She's like, I would nibble and preen all of you if I could, trust me. She's saying <laughs> I like to explore everything. She's saying congratulations to all the graduates of Zoom University. Uh <laughs> great job, everyone. Wow. The best little bird boops. Yes. <laughs> and then right back to trying to grab her her toy. Yes. <laughs> of course. Back to business. <laughs> back to trying to grab that toy so close you're so close we believe in you oh a little feather <laughs> so i do have um i have a couple food items i was going to offer makana so that we could watch one of them surface feed so you could kind of see how an albatross feeds in the water uh you guys want to do that yeah let's do it yes, please all right what are you feeling makana squid or prawn makana says both <laughs> All right, so we've got some snacks we've had on ice here. Grab my gloves. Do, do, do. So uh, this behind the scenes area here, uh, custom built too for, uh, for Makana and Alika, right? That is correct. So um, we actually recently redid their habitat um, to make the decks a little more accommodating. Uh, we wanted to widen the, um, basically widen the deck space for them. Uh, and then also, uh, we kind of changed up the doorways for ourselves. Uh, we switched to sliding doors to make it a little more easily accessible for people. Oh my gosh. So. That walk gets me every time. <laughs> no. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> the perfect little strut. All right. Off we go. Do, do, do. Got and uh, we, we we did have people just very quickly, uh, you know, we, we had people Makana. previously where uh, um, your colleague Madeline was doing uh, a TikTok uh, video in uh, this particular enclosure. Uh, oh, there it goes. <gasps> awesome. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what it's like to stand in the water right now in your waders, but in jeans? Are you worried? Are you stressed? Yeah. Uh, it's causing some anxiety for some friends at home. <laughs> I've got some really cool tall boots that I wear. So that's usually, I just put on these big boots. They keep my pants nice and dry. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, okay. So makana has got some food in the water. So what's, what's going on here? Yeah. Oh, well, now she's got to see what Alika has. She's like, did Alika get a squid? <laughs> yeah, so here's our squid here. She's like, don't you take it. That's fine. Yeah. You can get it. <laughs> So she she's gonna try to <laughs> she would rather you pick it up for her is that correct? She would. Yeah. <laughs> you can die for that girlfriend. Let's see if she. We'll give her a second. So their pool is about two feet deep. Um, it's the depth that it is, so that the birds can reach the bottom of it. Oh, there we go. That was Makana taking Alika's toy. <laughs> That's right. 
<laughs> now that Alika is no longer in position to potentially grab the squid, now Makan is feeling a little bit better. Exactly. Watching it. Makana, you're live right now to thousands of people. Let's <laughs> let's see you dive. She's on Makana time. That's true. Ooh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Very frustrated <laughs> that you're not picking it up for her. That is, yeah. <laughs> I appreciate that you picked that up, Patrick. Frustration is very much an emotion that they will sometimes display. Well, I, I think we're just channeling how we... Oh, yes! Okay. Yes! Can we get some W's in the chats uh, all across the internet, wherever you happen to be watching this? Makana diving down and grabbing that oh, squid. Let's get some W's there in the chat, everyone. Amazing. A perfect dive. Good job. Oh, and she did she just drop it again? <laughs> she does, yeah. There she so goes. She, she really enjoys mashing her food when she feeds in the water. Um, she'll sit here and just mash, 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 tear it up into just basically a mashy, mushy squid piece. And it's, uh, it does not look appetizing to me when it gets to that point, but Makana loves it. Wow. So just some tenderized calamari is uh, her preferred prep. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that there's a way of cooking um, squid well done, but she's trying to figure it out. That's awesome. That was so cool. I'll, honestly, you know, knowing Makana for many years, I've never actually gotten to see her dive down and grab a squid like that. That was super cool. Awesome. Yeah, no, she's, she's very capable. The best is when we uh, sometimes she'll reach for toys under the surface of the water and tow them out away from Alika. <laughs> <laughs> oh. She really... It's very, you know, Alika doesn't find it funny, but well, I enjoy getting to see the complex social dynamic. Well, Makana was an only child for a while, and I think that everybody yeah. who has that younger <laughs> sibling recognizes the dynamic uh, that at some uh -huh. point, you know, you need to remind them, like, you were here first. They were your toys first. <laughs> very much so. Shout out to my little sister. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. oh, and you can see just so much, so much personality and interaction between, between these two. Absolutely. That's like right. It. She's like, I'd rather have what Alika has. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and Alika saying, mom, protect me. Protect this toy. It's mine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure many a parent who has spent uh, this quarantine with their children has picked up on the specific dynamic there as well. <laughs> Good girl, Lynn. Good job. Amazing. Um, so uh, maybe we can go. Oh, I, I don't want to leave Makanacam. I just want to keep oh. stay on Makanacam this whole time. <laughs> Uh, Emily, what kind of questions do the do the folks have uh, at home there? I'm sure they're recognizing uh, their sibling dynamics and hierarchies. They're definitely recognizing yeah. it. Lots and lots of celebrations for Makana getting her squid there. Um, we did have a question, uh, um, a little to go a little bit more in depth about how they're flying, um, uh, how that works. Kayla, do you want to talk a little bit about those specialized wings and, and structures in there that help them fly? Absolutely. So albatross have the ability to lock their wings in place and they actually use a form of flying called uh, dynamic soaring. And they rely like very, very heavily on winds to help them carry themselves and to even get the lift to initially take off on a flight. <laughs> Makana is finding some other things to die for there. So, <laughs> this is it awesome. Can, um, you know, a not so windy day could be a day that an albatross can't even get off of its island to fly because they rely so heavily on it. Oh. But typically, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's similar to the paragliders that we sometimes see here uh, in the Monterey Bay where uh, having that headwind really crucial to get the, the wing it set to, for them to fly. Absolutely. Yeah. That's so cool. Yeah, and we do have a couple of folks who are just tuning in right now. So if you are just tuning in, uh, you're getting a great look behind the scenes of the aquarium right now. Uh, Patrick and myself are, uh, Patrick, myself, myself is Emily. Uh, Patrick That's you. And I are That's at you. Our, our, 
at our respective homes um, across the bay from each other while our amazing aviculturist Kayla is in the physical aquarium itself uh, with our two Laysan albatrosses, Makana and Alika. Um, I saw over on Facebook a couple of people asking what their wingspan is and for Laysan albatrosses, um, it can be anywhere between about five and six feet. So Makana is, is about five and a half feet. I actually don't know if I know how big uh, Alika's wingspan is, Kayla. Yeah, I, um, I'll be honest. Uh, we have not had an opportunity to, um, yeah, it, if we could easily ask her to open them and hold them up so I could hold up a tape measure, I would know for certain. Uh, but we are still working on those types of behaviors. Uh, but I uh, could guarantee it is bigger than Makana's. Uh, as a little bit larger bird, Alika's probably closer to six feet. That makes sense. Yeah. Now That's we were talking a little look bit. Look at that waddle. I'm so, <laughs> sorry, so Emily. Good. We just no, saw a really yeah. good waddle. There we go. <laughs> Amazing. We were talking a little bit before about uh, about their weight and how how much they weigh. So Makana there around four point eight pounds. Alika right around five pounds. But you know talking about these six foot wingspans and a bird that only weighs five pounds might be a little surprising for for some people that have you know cats that look about the same size as these that might weigh like 10 to 15 pounds Kayla but that lightweight helps them out there in the wild right absolutely it helps when you are a dynamic soaring bird to be as light as you can be so that is always surprising how much lighter albatross are than um how much lighter they are than one would think uh, even a uh, wandering albatross, you know, the largest seabird, 12-foot wingspan, on average, they only weigh about 16 pounds. Wow. Amazing. And just, I, I, I can't get over the dynamic of Alika, the youngster, wanting to play with all the toys, Makana <laughs> refusing for such joviality to be... <laughs> <laughs> to be present it's all about being a serious albatross at this point and makana coming over and just like no no octopus for you <laughs> a lot of times all of the toys will end up on this side of the pool sometimes where makana has put them <laughs> that's so funny that's so great uh, i don't know if we talked about this uh yet emily um and kayla but what is the significance of makana and alika's names yeah Can we so talk about makana that no, we have a Hawaiian means gift and Alika means guardian. Right. So Hawaiian names there for uh, these uh, Hawaiian albatrosses. So Makana for family, Alika guardian there. Um, yeah. So Makana, uh, Makana's gift. Patrick. Oh, I'm, I, I, I'm Ohana sorry. Is Ohana family. is what I was saying. Ohana. Sorry. No, because I was. <laughs> Uh, I had some Lilo and Stitch uh, yeah, channeling, yeah, channeling through. Sure. No, um, yeah. So Makana, um, Makana being a gift. I actually, uh, when I went, when I visited Hawaii, there was a, a store that had Makana uh, on there, and uh, I was like, oh, that they know our albatross. Clearly, she's world famous. <laughs> um, but yeah, so she came from Hawaii uh, from some research actually. Uh, they were doing um, to figure out breeding programs for uh, a different, more endangered albatross species. But can we talk about I'm the scritches? Sorry, yeah, I'm sorry. Can we talk about the scritches? Sorry, Patrick, sorry, sorry, sorry. My there apologies. Are bird <laughs> happening. How does yeah, an albatross? So, what does an albatross uh, feel like? Yeah. So um, if you ever have the opportunity to, um, trying to think, they're very soft. Their feathers <laughs> are incredibly soft. Uh, but oftentimes, oh. when I describe what the birds feel like, it's a wetsuit. Um, just that really smooth, um, just kind of dense, puffy feeling that a wetsuit has. It's very similar. And But there's also nothing quite like it, I'll be honest. Can you, <laughs> and this is a very contented albatross, oh. correct? Quite, yes. Makana will solicit uh, tactile from us. So she uh, will approach me with her head outstretched like that. And oftentimes I'll just kind of present a finger uh, to see if she's interested <laughs> in some scratches. Uh, which obviously at this moment she is. She um, she enjoys some scratches in the pool pretty frequently. Alika, uh, we're still kind of working on doing the tactile with her. What I have found is that she more often than not only prefers to be scratched when she's laying down, which um, as I've done research, learning more and more about the species, that's uh, it's very common for albatross. They oftentimes will sit together and when they're laying down, they'll do a lot of this alloprening on each other's uh, heads and faces. So. 
for Alika, it's a lot more, um, she's going more the instinct route, I'd say, with how she enjoys being uh, uh, what you, scratched. Yeah, scritches, scratches, um, the, te- yeah, the technical also, term. Um, uh, Makana will also solicit the attention from Alika at times, but Alika doesn't quite understand yet. <laughs> And we'll sometimes just kind of like grab Makana's whole face, which Makana is not the biggest fan of, but, but is a, you know, she's a good, she's a good mentor. She oh. tolerates so much from our goofy Alika, who's also wondering what's going on. <laughs> which, you know, at that point, um, you know, her grabbing Makana's face could be retribution for stealing the toys. Who knows? Very, very possible. Hey, Alika. That was adorable. Hello. Oh. What do you think? Now, Kayla, a couple pe- people Whoa, are Whoa, sorry. This is such a I know. such a good view of Alika right now. And you those, can see ooh, right there. see yeah. those eyes that those built-in sunglasses. And those Absolutely. two special tubes at the top of their beak there that helps to get rid of the salt. Amazing. And then um, a couple of folks curious, Kayla, have you ever been nipped uh, by by Alika trying to uh, preen back? Yeah, so uh, I a book I was reading described it best, uh, but their beaks can tickle or tear flesh. So, you know, I am always very mindful when I am interacting with them. When we are doing tactile, uh, I make sure that it's one, their choice that they are interested in being scratched. So like I said, I uh, wait for Makana to solicit attention from me typically. Uh, but there is kind of a funny time where I have had, Alika wants to get the pants. She's like, what are these pants? I love pockets. <laughs> so um, Makana can get really, um, she gets like a lot of high arousal when she is um, <laughs> tickling my leg. I'm so sorry. I've got to walk away. Here, here. That- <laughs> Play with the toy. Good girl. <laughs> um, <laughs> but no she gets a uh, high arousal when she's hungry so for example perhaps like right before she begins her molt it's normal for her to gain a, a little bit more weight and bulk up a bit so she uh, can be really excitable when we go to feed her and I um, my first time feeding her in that moment I did have her like reach out and bite me as I'd open the door um, wow. it, by no means did I interpret it as aggression. I think it was more just like, give me the food and give me the food now. So I, um, again, just learning to work with them. I'm a lot more careful and I pay a lot of attention to their behaviors to make sure that that does not happen. But yeah, <laughs> it's also normal for them to bite. You know, they communicate by nibbling at each other as well. So I, you know, I don't take it personally if I do get, nibble that like they would nibble another albatross that's just her saying yes no maybe so yeah as uh as someone who has been uh nibbled by by makana uh over the years by uh mismatching my dance moves to to hers you can definitely feel the um <laughs> feel feel the understanding of like you know distinct correction of my dance moves uh by by <laughs> by makana there um emily uh, uh, we maybe got some more questions from the from the folks out there at large. We also wanted to point out we've got about ah, five minutes or so uh, left here on this on the stream before we'll let uh, Kayla uh, get back to uh, what she's up to. But uh, what are some of the questions uh, that the folks have there, Emily? Uh, well, we had this great question uh, pop up a couple of times, and I don't know, uh, Kayla or Patrick, if you want to answer it, but we... Um, had a couple of people wondering uh, about albatrosses. Why do they have such a bad rap? Why do people think that they're bad luck? Ooh, that's a great question. It's, it's, I think it's okay. So I'm not that very familiar with the folklore of it, but I think it's like the rhyme of the ancient mariner or something mm-hmm. where yeah. yep. I know someone has a deceased albatross around their neck. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, yeah. Exactly. You can take so, it from there, Kayla. <laughs> yeah. yeah well, thank you. Thank you. I don't. I don't know everything. <laughs> no, but so the rhyme of the ancient mariner, as some of you folks out there may know, there's there's a reference to having an albatross around your neck, which is uh, referred to as a you know a burden or a sign of bad luck. And basically, paraphrasing, uh, if you haven't read the rhyme of the ancient mariner, uh, it's delightful. Go spoiler ahead. Spoiler alert. Yeah. Spo- yeah. Spoiler <laughs> alert. Right. We should point that out. <laughs> Um, but, uh, effectively you have, you have, uh, you have a captain of a vessel that, um, uh, kills an albatross and albatrosses were signs of good luck, 
uh, for sailors because it meant that not only had you found the trade winds, but you were also on a good migratory route to potentially find food, uh, fish, you know, land eventually. So albatross is great luck. People love albatrosses because it means you found the trade winds. Uh, very good for sailors. And killing an albatross uh, is a sign of bad luck because what ends up happening in this story is um, the albatross, um, the albatross is killed, and then the winds die, stranding everybody at sea, and thus causing a lot of issues uh, for uh, the mariner and everybody else there on, on the ship. And so they uh, attach this man to the mast, uh, tie him up, and then put the albatross around his neck as a sign of this is why we're cursed. This is why we don't have the the wind. Paraphrasing, embellishing. But that's that's the thing. So albatrosses are good yes. luck. If you have an albatross around your neck, it's because you messed up. You made you made a mistake. Ah. Um, so that would be the rhyme of the ancient mariner. Not only is this go. a science and animal stream, but it's also uh, your daily dose of literature. There you go. <laughs> yeah. You're welcome. Yeah, we won't uh, talk. We won't talk about Leucothea and the comb jelly and Homer's Iliad in this particular stream. That'll be for when we get. <laughs> the jelly the jelly <laughs> folks back on exactly yeah. uh well kayla i think maybe uh a last question for us to kind of wrap up with today is a lot of po folks are just absolutely enamored with these birds um how did you get to work with these animals and what kind of advice do you have for anyone who might like to become uh, an albatross's best bud one day yeah so uh, i honestly started out my career um i have a degree in animal science from kansas state university and i i knew i wanted to work with animals but i really really wasn't sure what i wanted to do so i had a college instructor that pointed me in the direction of the zoo field and so um, I honestly just kind of happened into an internship and fell in love with the job. My uh, love of birds came much later though. Uh, in 2016, I was fortunate enough to get sent down by my uh, previous institution uh, to go participate in the 2016 Humboldt Penguin Census. Whoa. So I got to go out on these uh, little Peruvian fishing boats and go count penguins all day long. And you know, it was a life-changing experience. Uh, the first day we went out, just seeing hundreds and hundreds of thousands of seabirds flying out to sea to go find their meals for the day. You know, there's really nothing quite like it. Um, so I was pretty hooked on birds from the moment that happened. And then the way I found my way to Monterey uh, was honestly uh, its own journey of itself. But the biggest thing is that, um, you know, I'm proud to work for an organization whose values align with my own. And I think that conserving the oceans is the way that we can save the planet. And I um, really value that and work towards it every day, both professionally and personally. So as far as finding ways to get involved with animals, getting as much hands-on animal experience is always the best way to go. And, you know, I can understand hearing that and thinking, I don't even live close to a zoo. Like, what in the heck could I do? But a big thing is volunteering at various organizations, you know, working uh, at the local shelter, walking dogs. is so beneficial. You learn so much about animal behavior. You learn how to manage animals and you get uh, to help, you know, dogs in your community, but also perhaps volunteering at a local nature center uh, and learning how to, you know, maybe you become a presenter and just do uh, walks with the owls on the weekends and you talk to people about owls. <laughs> There's just all kinds of ways to get involved with citizen science, as well as uh, different organizations around your own community that have animals. So those would be my main pieces of advice. <laughs> oh, well, that's awesome. Yeah. I mean, I can think of worse ways to spend a Saturday than talking about owls. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the only issue with that is that nobody knows who you're talking about because they keep going, who? Who, who? are you talking about? <laughs> who? Um, well, with that horrible pun, uh, Kayla, we're, we've hit it. We've hit an hour. Uh, if you want to transition back out uh, to uh, camera one, feel free to do so if you wanted to. Um, just right. super quick uh, for the folks um, that are. Let's see if I can. Can I spotlight myself here? Yes, I can. Um, so for the folks that are uh, watching right now, um, we did want to let you know. Um, yes, the aquarium uh, has had to delay its reopening. Um, 
so uh, for at least three weeks. So we do not know when the aquarium is going to be reopened. And so your support of the aquarium while we're closed is still one of uh, um, everything that you've been doing from subscribing on our Twitch channel, uh, donating there. Um, you're directly helping the aquarium right now while we don't have any visitors and that revenue. Uh, but we did want to point out that uh, we've got some merch on. So I've got the Monterey Bay Aquarium hat right here. Got the Mola Mola shirt here. We've also got the aquarium branded face mask there. And if I transition over to Emily, Emily is also modeling some of the merch uh, that we have um, for the for the aquarium. Our online store uh, is open for business. You can still purchase things there. That is one of the huge ways um, that we're able to get support um, for the aquarium uh, in this time. Uh, so, um, so that's just something that, that that we can all do here. Let me let me get all three of us back up on here. Um, so that's something you can <laughs> <Thank> do. You. <laughs> yeah, no, you I did great. I was trying to. I was so long. <laughs> trying to make it seamless. You look good there, Emily. So, uh, you know, not to be like too hard on the on the promotion part, but we really do need uh, your support, donations directly to the aquarium, becoming members of the aquarium in this time. Um, all of that uh, support really helps us out. Uh, not only pays for. Um, the food, the squid that Makana can go and dive for after that, but make sure that we have facilities and and um, and everything ready for all of the animals and that we can welcome you back uh, very soon. So that's a little bit of a plug there. Definitely feels weird to do, but we really appreciate all of you folks tuning in, watching, supporting the aquarium. So subscribe on Twitch, subscribe over on YouTube, uh, donate on Facebook, you know, whatever it is that you feel like doing to support the aquarium. Uh, it's, it's huge. It's going to really help us out. So um, with that, Kayla, thank you so much for all that water time with the birds. That was incredible. That I mean, I got to see some stuff I've never gotten to see before with Makana and everyone. So that was that was really great. Thank you for having me. It was wonderful. And thank you all for your questions and for partaking. This was great. <laughs> That's so awesome. Uh, Emily, any any part parting thoughts from the folks out there in the universe? Well, what are they what are they thinking? Oh, I sorry. I was busy uh, dropping those those links for our merch in our. Oh, in there our you go. There. Boom! Link um, in the description. Hooray. I mean, you know, at this at this point, we should just lean into the full influencers talk yeah. of just you know, smash <laughs> those bells. <laughs> yeah, it's, like it's your girl Emily. <laughs> exactly. Hey everybody, it's your aquarium. <laughs> we need your support. We got merch in the store. We do actually. Um, yes, we so. do. So thank you so much for that. Um, and again, uh, your donations uh, and support of the aquarium as members and people watching these live streams is huge and uh, helps make uh, Kayla's job work and uh, helps, um, yeah, helps all of these birds that we got here right behind us um, it, here at the aquarium and in the wild. So, all right. Well, that's pretty much the plug that I had. I think we did yeah. we did a good job, everybody. Thanks for watching good. this this live stream. All right. Yes. Um, here we'll we'll do this real quick oh we're gonna sign off with with cute young alika no nope. uh, no trooper just decided to the stream and she's cute too so. hey everybody there's trooper she's our sponsor for today trooper trooper trooper, trooper the stream pup hey, trooper, trooper is the stream pup oh that's so great we don't need to show my dirty apartment uh behind this so um <laughs> this works out perfect all right, everyone. Well, thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you again, Kayla, uh, for sharing all of uh, the information about our albatrosses. Keep up the great work. We'll let you go. Uh, thank you, Emily, for fielding all of those questions from the fine folks out there. Thank you, Trooper, for supervising the, the stream, as always. Went off without a hitch. Thank you for that. Uh, and my name's Patrick. Emily, Kayla, thank you so much uh, for tuning in from the Monterey Bay Aquarium to you. We hope you have a fantastic rest of your day. Uh, and I will put see up again. yeah we'll see you again soon i'll put up uh the the cover and we'll fade off into the afternoon thanks everybody <laughs>